and why you worship me. And so the book of Revelation is basically a letter to these seven churches. And it shows what John knows. And here's what John knew. He knew this, that the worship of a church is vital to its health and mission. You think about that. How a church worships is incredibly vital to the health of that church, the spiritual health of that church, and also to its mission. Because worship that is authentic keeps a church healthy, spiritually healthy, and keeps it effective. But worship that is not authentic, that reveals a church that becomes very shallow and self-centered. And so we're going to look at this, these couple chapters here this morning, and John's going to give us three supernatural truths about worship, right? Three supernatural truths about worship. And now before we get into this, I want you to, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something. Because what we're going to read is, is really imaginative. Now, I, I'm not, I think John saw a real vision here, but this vision is a very graphic vision. You're going to have to use your imagination. You're going to, at times, I think, maybe close your eyes and listen to the words and imagine what John is seeing. And you're going to have to use all of your senses, your hearing and your sight and your smell and touch and, and all of those things to fully grasp what John is going to show us about Jesus, right? So here's the first truth that he tells us, this first supernatural truth about worship, and it's this, is that worship is an invitation. Worship is an invitation. I'm actually going to start reading in chapter 3, verse 20, and I'm going to read several verses in a row, so, so here we go. It says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and I will eat with him. And he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to set with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the seven to the churches. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet, that's loud, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must soon take place after this. And at once I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne stood in heaven, one, one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones were the 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumbles and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was as if, there was as it were a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, were four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second like an ox, the third the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne 
who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast down their crowns before the throne and say, worthy are you, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Worship is an invitation. Now, we back up to the last words of chapter three, and Jesus is writing this letter, and he's writing this letter to the church in Laodicea. And this church was really struggling. This church was having a lot of problems, and Jesus ends his letter with this. Notice he says in chapter uh, three, verse 20 again, just glance at it real quick. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And then look at the very next words of chapter 4. Chapter 3, he tells the church, I stand at the door and knock. I'm waiting for you to open the door. And what happens when they open the door in chapter 4? They see the throne room of God. Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm inviting you in. The vision is absolutely amazing of what the throne room of God looks like. He sees this throne. And notice in chapter, in verse 3, he he says it's like, he uses the word like a lot. In other words, there are no human words to fully express the, the grandeur, the majesty, the immenseness of what John sees. He can't, he just says it's like this. Like this is the, the best I can come up with. There's no human words. And he sees 24 elders who probably represent the, the patriarchs of the Old Testament, the apostles of the New Testament. We see that God is worshiped by people of both testaments. And then he sees these amazing creatures, like the lion, the noble creatures, the ox, the strong creatures, man, maybe the wise ones, and then, of course, the eagle, the swift ones. And they have six wings, and they fly around, and they have eyes all around them, probably showing that they see everything all the time. We see, we see this amazing vision, and here's what it means for us. It means this is that when we accept the invitation to come to worship, it strengthens our spiritual health. When we accept the invitation that Jesus has to each one of us to come and to worship him, it strengthens our spiritual health. But see, that's what was really wrong with the seven churches. They were being persecuted, but they were not spiritually strong because they in general, and specifically the church in Laodicea, had been declining the invitation to worship. They had lost sight of who they really served. And John makes this incredible connection. He says, when you accept the invitation to worship, when you come in and you take this seriously, you will grow and your spiritual health will be strengthened. But when you decline the invitation to worship, your spiritual health will deteriorate. You'll become weak spiritually. You see, when our worship is weak, or self-centered, our spiritual health declines. But when our worship is focused on Jesus, our spiritual health strengthens. And Jesus is waiting at the door for us. Jesus is waiting at the door with an invitation to worship. I really do believe that we underestimate what happens every time we come together as a church in this room. Now, certainly you can worship at other times, but he's talking about corporate worship here. I think we underestimate what is going on this minute in this room. Worship is a supernatural experience. It is not just something we come and watch. It is something where there is a connection between us and the throne room of God. When we come together, we're invited into the presence of the living God. We're invited into his throne room. And Jesus had strong words for the church in Laodicea. And the strong words were this, because you're not taking this seriously. He literally says, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Because you're not hot and you're cold, you're just kind of going through the motions. Every single week, we are invited to come into the presence of God. And sometimes we just don't take it seriously. Sometimes we just act as if it's just something else on our schedule. It is the exact same thing for us. Jesus stands at the door and knocks and invites us corporately as a church, but individually as believers to come into his presence. And he asks us to come in and witness 
something truly supernatural. It's an amazing thing. Now, I want to give you a, just a very practical tip of how this experience can be the best for you. Right? It's, it's, it's very simple. It's this. The best way to make this experience amazing is to come early and stay late. Is to make this a priority and say, you know what, I'm going to be here 15 minutes early. I'm not going to rush in. I'm not going to be worried about stuff. I'm going to come here. I'm going to prepare myself. I'm going to get ready to come into the throne room of God. And I'm not going to leave early. I'm going to stay and see every single thing that God has for me. That's the best way to make this experience truly what God wants it to be. You see, worship is an invitation. Jesus stands at the door and knocks. And the question is just simply, are you going to open the door and walk through it? Worship is an invitation. Here's the second truth that we see. It's in Revelation chapter 5. And it's this, is that worship is a revelation. It's not just an invitation, but it's a revelation. Look in chapter 5, verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and look into it. And I began to weep loudly. I began to weep. Because there was no one found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And then one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Oh, that's great news. Now here's look at what happens next. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing, as though it had been slain, with seven horns, with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And we had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Worship is a revelation. It reveals to us who we truly worship. Now think about this. These chat, like it's hard for me. I'm about as an unemotional person as you can possibly be. And it is hard for me to read these verses without being emotional. And, and I truly mean that. It is hard for me to read these verses and not get a little choked up because of the significance of what it says. They give us an image of Jesus in this powerful, powerful way. So God has the scroll. The one who's seated on the throne, he has a scroll. And his readers would have immediately known that he was talking about the Old Testament. That's, that's the scrolls. And the, this, the Old Testament represented God's plans, his decrees, everything that God was going to accomplish in this world. And there was no one who was able to open it. No one who was strong enough to break the seals on the scroll. And John begins to weep. He begins to weep because all of God's plans will go unaccomplished, unfulfilled. Everything that God had been doing will not happen because no one is worthy to open it. But then one of the elders says, there's good news. We found the one who can open it. You see, one of the elders brings that good news. And the good news is this, is that the one who has opened it, and he describes this, the one who can open it, in these amazing terms. These are Old Testament messianic terms. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? You think a lion, big and strong. The lion is strong enough to open this. The root of David. This is one who the promises had flown through. And, and he describes someone that you think is going to be this, this strong, commanding presence. The one who's going to walk in and say, I can fulfill this. The one who is strong enough to open it. Except John sees the exact opposite. He doesn't see 
a, a general standing there with a sword. He doesn't see a politician there writing laws. What he sees is a lamb standing there. And not just a lamb, not just a cute, fluffy little lamb, a lamb that had been slain, a lamb that had been sacrificed, bloody, abused, cut, slaughtered. A horrific sight, although a common sight for the Jews because they understood that was a lamb who had been sacrificed to pay for the sins of someone else. You see, the only way that Jesus conquered was not by might, as we think of might. He conquered because he gave his life as a ransom, as a sacrifice for others. Only the sacrificed Messiah could truly be the conquering Savior. And you see the song that they sang, Worthy are you to take the scroll. And I, and I think this reveals something very important to us, and it's this, is that keeping our focus on who we worship makes how we worship far less important. When we keep our focus on who we worship, the how becomes less important. What's truly the center of attention for us? Every week we come together to worship the Lamb, particularly, now we do it through the whole service, but particularly we do it during communion. We just took that. And we worship the lamb through that. We remember the sacrifice that he made. And so, so often we get obsessed and hung up on the how we worship and we lose sight of the who we worship. This, this became very clear to me personally a few weeks ago. And uh, a, a, a few weeks ago I had some time off and I was uh, going around and visiting some churches and things like that. And, and I got to a point where I was like, I don't, I don't know where I'm gonna go to church this weekend. So I had time off. So I called my friend Jason, and uh, Jason is a good friend of mine. I said, Jason, can I come to church with you? Now, Jason goes to a black church, and his mom is the pastor, Pastor Cece. And she's a wonderful lady. She was a student of mine at St. Louis Christian College, and I was like, I'm going to go to church with Jason. And he lives just across the river in Illinois, and uh, this is where his church is. And so I'm going to go to church there. Now, I went there, and this is a wonderful church, a small church. Uh, a wonderful church that they literally welcomed me with open arms. And when I mean that, I got a month's worth of hugs in one morning there, right? So it, it was a fantastic thing. But I have to tell you, because the church worshiped in such a different way than I'm used to, I was really nervous. I, I was just, I, I was unsettled. And not because of the people, they were amazing and fantastic. I love them all to death, but I was just nervous. And I, and I went through the beginning of the service going, I, I don't know what they're doing. They're, they're singing songs, I don't know, right? Uh, I, can't, I can't move to the music, right? I, I don't have all that, right? And uh, I, I became really self-conscious. Honestly, I really did. And then when they took the offering, they, they, they took the offering up front. I'm like, oh, I, don't have any, I don't have any cash to take up front. I mean, I was just really obsessed with the how. Not because the how was bad, because it just, I was just a little uncomfortable. And in the, in the middle of like the second song set, I, I just had this, this feeling, I was like, man, why am I obsessing about this? Why, why am I so uh, unease? And it really dawned on me, it's like, I'm focusing on the how and I'm not seeing the who. We worship the same God. And at the point in which I said, you know what, I'm gonna let myself go <laughs> and, and all of my uneasiness about the how of worship, everything changed. Now the service didn't change. It was the exact same service. What changed was my perspective. And the instant my focus went to who I'm worshiping, the how became so much less important. The how almost vanished. And I realized, man, what an experience. How much I was going to miss by focusing on the how of worship and not the who. And I appreciate that, those, those wonderful people for teaching me that. You see, there's more to worship than the how. The most important part of worship is the who we worship, and it's the same God. Now, there's more to the vision in verses 11, chapter five, verse 11, and it's this. Worship is participation. It's participation. Look in chapter five, verse 11. He says, then I looked and I heard around the throne the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands 
saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Well, something amazing happens in these chapters. If you go back and look, here's what you see. The four living creatures sang to God. The 24 elders fell down, they laid down their crowns. That's a sign of giving up their, their rights, giving up their power, giving up their identity to who Jesus was. And they sang. The creatures and the elders sing together. Thousands and thousands of angels sing with a loud voice. Finally, every creature in heaven, on the earth, and under the sea sings. But here's what we need to know, is that participation in worship empowers the community of believers. When we participate in worship, it empowers the believers around us. The reality is that worship is a verb. It is not something else. It's really not an adjective, it's really not a noun, it's a verb, which means that worship is an action. It is active participation. Worship is not something we passively observe. It's not something we attend, it's something we do. And when we come together, we sing praises to the God of all creation, and we sing with all creation, with others in this room when we worship, you, with the people standing beside you, with those sitting on the other side, we're joining together and offering praise to God. With our church in Troy, Missouri, we're worshiping with them this morning. And with our brothers and sisters at our churches in Mexico, in Nicaragua, in Ethiopia, in Indonesia, and in India. And not just Harvest or Christian Church, but with all our churches. Here's the thing, is that worship isn't about anything in this room other than you and God. Worship is where we lay down our crowns. When we come before God and say, Lord, you are the king. I serve you. I give my heart to you and I surrender my will to you. Worship is where we lay down our rights and our identity and lay them before God. And Jesus invites us to come to the throne room of God and the lamb stands before us. This is a supernatural event that Jesus invites us into. And I wanna join with all creation, when they sing it, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Say it with me. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. But it was with a loud voice. It's a loud voice, say it again. Say it like the revelation tells us to. Shout it if you want, stand and shout it. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Do you believe it? Stand and say it. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom